Good morning. The first item of business is general questions. And at question number one, I call Evelyn Tweed. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what steps it has taken to improve access to childminders. Minister Natalie Don. Childminders are a hugely valued part of the early learning and childcare profession in Scotland, and we want more families to be able to access the unique benefits that they can offer to families. We have been working hard with the Scottish Childminding Association on a new approach for the sector, and I am really pleased to confirm a three-year programme of childminder recruitment and retention was launched on June the 5th. Backed by more than a million pounds of Scottish Government funding, the programme for Scotland's childminding future will be available in at least 16 local authorities during the first year. The programme will see the SCMA scale up their already successful pilots, which include a £750 start-up grant and tailored support for new childminders, as well as more practical assistance for the existing workforce. Clint Tweed. Childminders provide a vital service but often work alone. How will the government ensure that childminders are supported and that childminding can be a sustainable career? Mr. Ms Tweed is correct that childminders often run a business on their own, so it is important that they feel both supported and connected to others in the profession. The SCMA's new programme will implement a range of further measures to help childminders with their workloads and professional development, building on the diverse range of support that they already provide. This will include more practical assistance to existing childminders, includes the piloting of a new mentoring scheme, which aims to help reduce workplace isolation and create networks of support. It also includes a trial of funded time off the floor, which will test models of funded time for childminders to undertake professional learning and networking activities. From the feedback and engagement I have had, I believe that these actions will help to ensure childminding remains a valued, sustainable and fulfilling career choice. Brief supplementary, Ros McCall. Uh, thank you. Um, a few weeks ago, the Scottish Government announced plans to increase Scotland's childminding workforce by 1,000. However, Scotland lost over 2,500 childminders between 2012 and 2022. So, does the Minister accept that the plans don't really go far enough, and how do they intend to replace 1,500 childminders as well as retain to fulfil the 1140 childcare flexibilities that were promised by the Scottish parents? Minister. Well, I, I thank Ros McCall for that question, and I would say that this pilot is a really, really positive start. However, I think we know that we have more to do because, as I have previously iterated and said, child, childminders are a hugely valued part of our childcare sector. So we want them to be, feel valued and we want them to feel safe in, in their roles. Now, this pilot will have, I think, really valuable learning. We will see how successful this pilot is. I am very, very positive about the success of it, and then we will take further actions based on that. That learning. Brief supplementary, Martin Whitfield. I am very grateful, presiding officer. Can I ask the minister, and I do reflect the fact that they are hugely valuable in our child services, child minders. What figure does she hope to get to by 26 27 for the child minding community, given that we are currently at 3,225, and as was previously stated back in December 2012, it was 6,200? What is the minister's target? Minister. We are aiming to increase the childminder sector by 1,000. In our first year, SCMA are aiming to recruit 250 new childminders. As I've said, this is a really positive start with big aims. Childminders are, as I say, a hugely valued part of our sector, and I'm very positive about this campaign and this pilot and what it will bring for the sector. Question number two, Paul O'Kane. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on its ongoing work with local authorities, Police Scotland and other partners to tackle the reported increasing antisocial behaviour in town centres. Minister Siobhan Brown. Thank you, Presiding Officer. We support Police Scotland and local authorities to continue to invest in prevention, early intervention and diversionary acti activities to reduce antisocial behaviour. They have a wide range of powers and they are best placed to lead on addressing these issues. Additionally, an independent working group on antisocial behaviour is currently examining our strategic approach to antisocial behaviour in, and is undertaking widespread engagement to deliver their report later this year. We have also provided local authorities with over £600 million of additional revenue, while Police Scotland has received an increase of £92.7 million despite difficult financial circumstances due to UK Government austerity. 
I thank the Minister for her answer, and she will be aware of the problems of antisocial behaviour across the country, but specifically in parts of Barhead, which is in my region, uh, and particularly around the Asda supermarket. Um, we debated this issue last year, and uh, other members uh, put across to the Minister the challenges, particularly around supermarkets across the country. I have been engaging with the various stakeholders. I noticed that she referred to her independent working group in its reporting later this year, but will she agree to meet with me to give me an update on that work, uh, and can she be any more specific on the timescale for publication. Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Yes, I would be more than happy to, uh, to meet with the member, but also just with the timescale, it is the end of this year. Um, I do feel with retail especially that we've seen an increase um, against antisocial behaviour, so we are working with that. The member might be interested to also know that I have been visiting local authorities and seeing initiatives that are working around the whole of Scotland, and I am looking to implement this and good guidance towards local authorities moving forward. Brief supplementary, Audrey Nicholl. Thank you, Presiding Officer. As the police are often the first line of response to incidents of antisocial behaviour, it is absolutely vital that policing continues to be a priority for the Scottish Government. So, with that in mind, can the Minister provide further detail as to the funding being provided by the Scottish Government in policing to ensure that antisocial behaviour in communities continues to be fully addressed? Minister. Officer, uh, policing remains a Scottish Government priority and despite difficult financial circumstances due to austerity, the Scottish budget for 24 to 25 includes record police total funding of £1.55 billion, which as just said is an increase of £92.7 million. This increase includes an additional £75.7 million resource budget to protect and to support frontline policing. Decisions on the allocation of these resources, including those designed to tackle antisocial behaviour, are quite properly a matter for the Chief Constable, who is accountable to the SPA. When the 24-25 budget was announced in December last year, Ms Farrell made clear to the Criminal Justice Committee that the allocation is an important recognition of Police Scotland's value and the contribution policing makes to Scotland being a safe place to live and work with historically low levels of crime. Sharon Dowie. Thank you, Presiding Officer. While I welcome free bus travel for under 22s, one unintended consequence is that a minority of young people have abused the scheme to commit antisocial behaviour outside of their hometowns. The Transport Minister has since told us that she has asked officials to look at what temporary digital blocking measures could be used. Can the Minister tell us what conversations she's had with the Transport Minister and update us on what digital blocking measures could be used to withdraw free travel from the minority of young people who commit antisocial behaviours across our towns? Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I have had several conversations with the Cabinet Secretary for Transport. We have to remember the vast majority of young people who travel by bus behave appropriately. Although the Scottish Government can withdraw or suspend a card if a person knowingly allows it to be used by another, the legislation that underpins the current scheme does not provide a clear mechanism for blocking of cards relating to the allegations of antisocial behaviour. The Antisocial Behaviour Scotland Act 2004 provides a wide range of measures for dealing with all antisocial behaviour, including dispersal orders, which can be considered by police in consultation with the local authority on an individual temporary basis. Transport Scotland is also Briefly, working please, closely Minister. with the bus industry to develop and implement any measures that can be taken forward to deter antisocial behaviour. Thank you. Question number three, Sue Weber. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government whether it can provide further details on the progress that it has made regarding the delivery of a railway station in Winchborough, including the date by which it anticipates the business case and the cost will be finalised. Minister Jim Fairley. <coughs> Thank you, President Officer. As the member is aware, this proposal is included in the Council's development plan, and it was always the case that this was a developer-led proposal and one which I welcome, as I know that the MSP for the constituency, Fiona Hislop, does as well. Now, there have been calls for the government to get involved because of a lack of progress in taking this project forward for various reasons, and a call which I am happy to do so insofar as bringing the parties together which will allow progress. Now, I met in April with Winchborough Developments Limited, West Lothian Council and Network Rail to discuss how they can support progress towards the delivery of a station in Winchborough. Now, all parties agree to several actions, and Transport Scotland officials are investigating the development of the business case. 
and I am aware that the Council have now written to the City Region Deal Project Office to explore opportunities through this funding process. And the Scottish Government remains committed to progressing the proposal and are supporting the Council and the developer and encourage them to continue engaging with the Government on this matter. Sue Webber. I thank the Minister for that response and I can remind him that no developer has ever led the delivery of a new station anywhere in Scotland. The economic and environmental case for a train station at Winchborough is undeniable. Passengers will save £2.4 million, there will be £3.5 million of decongestion benefits. There will also be almost half a million fewer car journeys every year. The list goes on, and you have acknowledged this in your letter to Edward Mountain, convener of the Net Zero Energy and Transport Committee, and there is a keen interest to build the station at Winchborough. It remains of significant public interest. Your meeting, the next meeting is in five days. The people of Winchborough deserve much more. Can we expect a positive announcement and significant progress to be made before we return to Parliament in September? Minister. Uh, to correct what uh, the member has just said, Bulgray Station is proposed with East Renfrewshire Council acting as the lead proposer. Now, the Council have obtained the required funding through the successful application to the City Region deal, and transport officials have provided East Renfrewshire Council with the strategic support towards the development of the outline business case and the final business case process. So it's not correct to say that a Council cannot lead on these. This is a, this is a developer led this Members. is a developer-led programme. The government will support them in every way that we can to take it forward, but the local authority and the developer have to sit around the table so that we make sure we can get this progressed. Question number four, Alexander Burnett. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to support schools in rural communities. Minister Graeme Day. Presiding officer, uh, rural schools play an important role in our communities in Scotland. There is a presumption against the closure of rural schools. Where local authorities plan to close a the school, they are required to undertake a thorough and lengthy consultation process. This includes demonstrating the educational benefit of the closure, considering the impact of the school closure on the local community and school travel arrangements, and consulting the community on alternatives to closure. This process ensures that the impact of any decision is properly considered and options are explored. No school closure decision should ever be taken lightly. Alexander Burnett. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary wrote to me on the 3rd of June to confirm the most recent list of rural schools in Scotland showed there were 21 mothballed primary schools, with Aberdeenshire and Highland Councils having the most with four in each. That list was in 2021, three years ago. Now, in Aberdeenshire alone, I believe there are now 14 mothballed, with 16 more at risk, including Tully Nessel and Logie Colston in my constituency. This is a clear betrayal of our rural communities. So does the Minister have any idea how many primary schools are currently mothballed across Scotland and what is he going to do about it? Yeah. Minister. You really do need to admire the brass neck behind that question, given that Aberdeenshire Council is Tory controlled. Um, President officer, local authorities have the responsibility for the school estate and decisions around closures and mothballing of schools are for them to take. And ministers can only, only have the power to call in a local authority decision where the closure of the school is permanent. From the information that we have been provided with in relation to Tully Tully Nessel, uh, thus far I should say, that would appear not to appear to be to constitute a permanent closure. However, my officials have written to the local authority to seek further information about their plans and to remind them, in this instance, of their responsibilities under the school's Consultation Scotland Act 2010. In regard to the numbers that the member is seeking, I, I will write to them on that. But I, I go back to my point earlier, presiding officer, absolute bra brass neck. And if Mr Burnett is genuinely concerned about, uh, about, and shares the concerns of local residents about the two school mothballings, um, as they are referred to, he might want to have a chat with some of his councillor colleagues in Aberdeenshire. Christine Graham. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I am sure the Minister will welcome the progress in two secondary new build schools in my constituency, Peebles High and Gala Academy, both due to complete next year, funded by the Scottish Government. But does he agree with me that it is a massive burden on Scottish Borders Council budget that previous border secondary schools were built under PPP PFI in 2009 by the then Tory Liberal Democrat administration? at an initial cost of £72 million, but by the end of the contract in 2039 it will cost them £258 million, and that we should never forget the punishing continuing cost of funded projects by PPP-PFI, which thankfully Briefly, the Scottish Government ditched. Minister. 
of the Scottish Government were pleased to announce the, in December 2020 that we would provide financial support to Borders Council for their priority projects, namely Gala Shields Community Campus and People's High School through Phase 2 of the joint £2 billion learning estate investment programme. As the member rightly notes, this is not through the discredited PFI scheme, which the public purse is still bearing the cost of, limiting the amount of money that we and indeed councils have to invest in frontline services. The toxic legacy of PSI is still being felt in Scotland, and Labour members in this chamber should be ashamed of their party's record of the government. Question number five, Annabel Ewing. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the Developing the Young Workforce programme in the Cowdenbeath constituency. Minister Graham Day. Officer, developing the Young Workforce plays a crucial role in the delivery of the Scottish Government's commitment to ensuring that school leavers are supported to achieve their potential. DYW schools coordinators and regional groups, including the Edinburgh and South East Scotland DYW regional group, which covers Fife, take the lead on planning and delivering tailored events to meet the needs of young people and employers, facilitating connections with a range of delivery partners. The Government remains committed to DYW, with funding of £12.9 million being invested in 2024-25 to fund regional groups and schools coordinators. Annabelle Ewing. I thank the Minister for his response. He will be aware, of course, that Fife has in fact been a trailblazer in facilitating vocational training for young people with Lockelly High School, the Purvis Group and Babcocks, amongst others, having played a pivotal role over the years. Can I ask the Minister what can be done to see such an embedding of the Developing the Young Workforce programme right across Scotland to ensure that all that can be done is being done to provide young people with a route into skilled and well-paid jobs? Minister. President, officer, I absolutely share Annabel Ewing's high regard for the work of DYW, whether that be in her Cowden Beath constituency across Fife or elsewhere in Scotland. I also agree entirely that there is more to do to embed DYW into the offering we give our young people as they consider their future career paths. The nature of DYW provision can vary from local authority to local authority, and that is why my officials are working with DYW to see how we might enhance their standing. I have also been clear that I see DYW as an important pillar of the improved wider careers offering we are developing as we seek to furnish our young people with the fullest possible understanding of the options they have at their disposal. Thank you. Question number six has been withdrawn. Question number seven, Elena Whittam. To ask the Scottish Government, in light of research by the Institute of Fiscal Studies indicating that forecast UK government tax and spending plans would be funded by reductions in public investment, what assessment it has made of the potential impact that any changes to Scotland's block grant resulting from this would have on Scotland's public finances? Cabinet Secretary Shona Robinson. As highlighted by the Institute for Fiscal Studies, whoever wins the election, unprotected budgets face cuts of up to £20 billion by 2028 29 We do not know what this means for our budget, as the IFS have also pointed out that there is absolutely zero clarity from either the Conservatives or Labour about where those might fall. However, decisions by the UK Government have already cost Scotland up to £1.6 billion in potential consequentials, and it is clear that any future UK Government will deliver more of the same for Scotland. Lena Whittam. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her answer. I am deeply concerned by the scale of the cuts we face under the next UK Government. If a more realistic position is not taken by the leading Westminster parties, will the Cabinet Secretary call on her next UK counterpart to seriously consider the merits of Scotland's more progressive tax system of income tax, which could potentially provide over £15 billion in additional tax take for vital public services if applied across the rest of the UK? Cabinet Secretary. So we have uh, repeatedly called on the UK Government to use the powers at its disposal to provide the funding needed to invest in our vital public services. Our own decisions on income tax since devolution will uh, see an additional £1.5 billion raised in 2024-25 compared to if we had matched current policy in the rest of the UK. Ultimately, our position is that far greater powers over taxation should be devolved so we can design a tax system that works for Scotland and allows us to raise the revenue needed to invest in vital public services. Brief supplementary, Daniel Johnson. I was just wondering if uh, the Cabinet Secretary could uh, outline 
what the IFS says about the gap in it, the SNP's uh, 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 fiscal projections in, from their manifesto launch yesterday, and indeed how it intends to fill the £2 billion black hole that the Fiscal Commission outlines in the Scottish Government's uh, financial plans. Cabinet Secretary. Well, I think uh, Labour are on uh, very dodgy ground uh, indeed, given that they will not clarify whether or not they are going to continue Members. with an austerity budget uh, if they win the election, which will uh, mean that cuts of up to £20 billion will ensue by 2028-29. On top of that, of course, the leader of the Scottish Labour Party has said that they will reverse the tax-raising uh, uh, powers that we have uh, uh, used here in Scotland that have raised £1.5 billion. If that reversal happens, then not only will we have the austerity cuts Members. from Westminster, we will then have a double whammy of £1.5 billion of less funding for vital public services and the public need to know about those plans from Labour.